of our clothing and hauling big open-work baskets of plants so that they can drink uh, and throw them into canoes. Uh, here is, is uh, oh, this must be Gulican in this case. You don't collect Gulican along the shore like that, but uh, the, this painting does show the dumping of Gulican into baths uh, at the Gulican camps in the spring. There's still snow in that time. Uh, this is setting the, uh, we are setting the, the, the Gulican nets under the ice and uh, driving the big sledges, driving the, the anchor posts, and then uh, uh, there are special shapes, uh, prong-like uh, things to push the net down. They cut a long slot in the ice and then attach the nets and then push them down through the slot and then it floats under the water and then cut another hole and pull the end of the net up and the fish come into this open area coming upstream, uh, swim along and are eventually caught here and all you have to do is pull up the end of the net that has all the lilicans in it and dump it on the ice. You don't pull the whole net. So it's a very special way of getting fish under ice. And then the rendering of the lilican, uh, heating in stones until they're red hot. You see how the glass plates have in some cases broken here, so you get the funny <laughs> design on the side, just cracks in the glass. But then with these wooden tongs, take these red hot stones and drop it into these big plank vats in which there are basket load after basket load of hooligans, so there are just billions of hooligans in those vats, and water. And of course, the grease renders out and separates and is skimmed off and purified. Um, I really don't know what's going on there. Looks like there's another seaweed chopping block. I really can't tell that. Uh, this represents the racks of Ulipans. Those, he's done it in a rather impressionistic style. You can see how small these paintings are, though, because here's somebody's thumbprint, maybe Alexi's. You can see it. It's, it's on the original painting. And uh, so the whole painting is only that big. Uh, so it's got a lot of detail in there for such small paintings. They have a charm of their own, but they're also very accurate. I'll show you photographs of these Ulican drying racks if you haven't seen them before. And they do look just like that. And then once the grease has been rendered out, it's uh, put into chests and all tied up bound up and uh, then loaded into canoes for transportation somewhere else. Um, more temporary camps, just made with planks very quickly. Here you see the planks tied together like we were looking at in that photograph uh, to quickly build a structure uh, at one of the seasonal camps. Uh, I suppose this should have come before that. And it shows hauling planks from the big winter village to the camp and putting up a temporary residence. The same thing with the same kind of structure. I have photographs of some of these structures and they're along the same lines. And canoe making, the, uh, the burning out of the inside of the canoe and then uh, charring and, and uh, this would again be prehistoric style of canoe making. Another view of sailing, uh, perhaps on a sealing expedition. And trading uh, with the Hudson Bay Company trader. Here is one of the uh, glass plates that uh, was broken and uh, they managed to glue some of it back together, but it was another one of the panoramas of Port Simpson. I must look this up and, and photograph some of these in more detail. I haven't gotten around to that. But thank God they didn't just throw it all away. They did lose quite a chunk out of the middle of it, but uh, there's still some detail in there. A little bit of detail there. 
You can see the uh, carved and painted frontal poles. Those are, are probably very like the uh, ones in the little models. It'd be nice to be able to put all of that together and identify where they were in the house. He drew a lot of ritual objects, and uh, this is a, an interesting one, Abalone Bow. And that's a name that comes up frequently, and uh, people even carry that name as individual sometimes, the Abalone Bow. And it has this special arrow with a bird on it that sings a whistle. So when you shoot the arrow in the Abalone Bow, this bird sings. Uh, and it's used in, in Bacchus. I think I can do it in the dark. And it's available um, through Renee Laundry. She can order that for you. I don't know at this stage. I'm sure in part of your research it might be significant to get a copy of that. Uh, it's not very expensive, about $20 a reel for the microfilm, and the whole thing is on one reel. So you can get that whole file for $20 or so. That's $20 Canadian, I think that's about $5.95 U.S. <laughs> Is this safe? Are these tapes are for sale? Yes, yes. Anything that the museum has is, is available at cost, whatever it costs the museum. And often they'll send Xeroxes and things, and what they won't charge it for them, unless it gets to be six or 700 pages or something. But generally, you know, if, if it's something they can absorb in a budget, they're happy to send it to you for your research purposes. But if it gets a lot of tapes, for instance, then, you know, whatever the tape cost is. But no, you don't pay for technician time or any of the transfer costs. Or, that's all free service. So uh, that's a good name to know, uh, uh, Renée Landry. She, she's very dedicated to the Barbo files and the Bainan files. And so we have just recently microfilmed all, I believe we're finished microfilming all the Bainan material now. And, uh, and then the Port Simpson material, which I think probably is of interest to you, right back to the original field notes are all there and now on microfilm. And if you want, you can get them on microfiche, you know, if you want them on real or if you want them in those little sleeves. It's, uh, it doesn't matter, you just tell them what you want at the time. And then I would ask them now, if, if you were writing to them, to send you a listing of the tapes. And then and keep you on the mailing list. If you say that, then uh, as soon as any new ones are done, they should send you a note. Can you saying, ask her to send for us all the scholarly Simpsons want to go to Ottawa? <laughs> send, send you. <laughs> you better have to put on there. Listen to all of them. Ottawa. <laughs> well, you got to ask Washington for that. I'm yeah, pretty it's it's true. <laughs> Not Ottawa. <laughs> but uh, uh, Ottawa would be very happy to have you come. We did have you, uh, or at least. Jack Hudson brought quite a few students one year, and uh, we, you know, showed them around Ottawa and what things we had uh, in the way of carvings and so on uh, for one week that, uh, that Jack brought some students. So, and Ira came, of course, uh, another time and uh, spent time with the collection, so he already knows the Barbold files. I've been there three times. Three times? No, no okay. pain. So you you probably, well, you have met Rene Laundry. I, I met the young lady woman somewhere. To, uh, to the one the She's the one, you know, you can't get by her and get to the Barbo files. You've got to <laughs> navigate that. Yeah, well, yes. 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 And they have a lot of maps. There, there are sort of three things that you might be interested in getting. Um, all of the, the music and linguistic material are on tapes. Um, so that would include uh, songs. Um, what else? Uh, he did record some of instruments, so you know what they were like. And uh, yeah, oral histories are there's some on tape. Uh, and then things like uh, well, linguistic uh, terms and names and so on. So linguistic tapes. Now, they have the original Barbeau material. They also then have uh, later Simpson material, because after Barbeau left the museum in 48 uh, or so, or not, no, yeah, by, 
54, I think, was the date. Is there anything on language? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, we've had contracts even very recently, and so Bruce Rigsby, for instance, has done uh, contracts uh, for us uh, collecting. We have some of his tapes on Kosin Sin, and he did some work uh, at Metlakatla one time. I remember he did a contract for me when I was doing archaeology there to collect place names and, and stuff about the economic cycle right in Metlakatla in uh, Prince Rupert Harbor. So there, there is there's various oral material on tape, and then there are films. Now let me think. I really, again, wish I could have brought the films. Swinging it around in the yeah. for a while so we can all see what you're okay. your drawing. I mean, right. Yeah, that's good. Um, they're good, they're good drawings. Oh, <laughs> call them drawings. <laughs> I see what they were. They were them around. The uh, the films. Now, let me give you a quick resume of what there is in film. Uh, Harlan I. Smith. I don't know if you know that name at all. Uh, he was the first anthropologist, full time staff of the museum. Uh, always use the I, it wasn't just H. Smith, but Harlan I. Smith was the person that Boaz hired as the photographer for the Jessup North Pacific Expedition in 1905. And before that, Smith had been an archaeologist. They had dug some shell middens in Kentucky and other places in the East. And he, he was around New York City, and he encountered Boaz, and Smith was quite a good photographer as well as a trained anthropologist. So Barbo hired him, sorry, Boaz hired him to be the photographer, and he came right up the coast. He started down in uh, Salish territory, and he ended up, uh, you know, right uh, the northern Tlingit zone. And he photographed a lot of material at that time, left photographic records. A lot of the things you've seen already were taken by Harlan I. Smith. Well, about the 20s, he became interested in filmmaking. And so he made a lot of short films, particularly on the Skeena River. Uh, some Nishka films. And we have a, a booklet, and if I can only remember the name of it. Um, and it was he with Lissol or Boaz? He was with Boaz when he started out, but then in 1910, his, uh, his first permanent job was with the National Museum in Ottawa. So from then on, he did work to some extent with uh, Barbeau, too. And the, uh, there is a, one of the booklets that looks like that thing on the Skeena River, uh, and it's by David Zimmerly. Um, he's on the staff, he's really the ethnographer for the Eskimo area, but he's interested in films and he's brought together description, short descriptions of all the film holdings of the National Museum. And it came out in the Canadian Ethnological Service Mercury series. And it's called something like an index of films of the Canadian Ethnological Service. And uh, so I think again from this uh, marketing area, when you write to them, you could ask them, I believe it's a free item, you could ask them for a listing of films too. Some of them are quite interesting, the films that, that he made. Uh, a lot on the, well for instance, the use of pack dogs in the interior, in the trails. Um, Dr. McDonald, I know between Ira and I and a, a half a dozen some chance in Madagascar here, we are planning that we're going to start a standing committee for the next five years to start work on our 100th anniversary in mm -hmm. And we are interested in finding films and also filming a uh, reenactment of the landing. Mm -hmm. That's what we're thinking about. We're, oh, yeah. we're thinking out loud of what we think should be done. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, somewhere along the line, we'll have to have some people like you and those people that will probably help us. Well, that's what we're paid for, so you know yeah. we we don't mind doing that. So call on us. Don't we need some the direction here, there, and you know, where to get funding? Uh, this way, we need it. And uh, some people right around here. 
rich people can donate a thousand dollars a piece of all the goods to me. <laughs> <laughs> Filming <laughs> is expensive. It is. Make a long list. We got five years. Uh, yes. No, I think that's a, a very worthwhile project. Um, well, you know, probably what you should do in that regard then is to uh, make a list and, and get copies to look at uh, all the films you can that have already been made. Because I find that as well as these films by Harlan I. Smith that were made back in the 1920s, there are about five Hicksan ones. One of the reasons he made them is that I did mention before, they started a totem pole restoration project aimed at encouraging tourism on the Skeena River and getting people to ride the railroad. And that all got shot to pieces by the pressure. But while it was active, the idea was to make some promotional films. So he first of all made some field films, and those are very good ethnographic documents. And then later on, he got the CNR, the Canadian National Railways, to sponsor a larger film. And it's called something about in, in the land of the totems. And uh, it's a more general one. But it has a lot of things in Kipplunga, for instance. And uh, comes down right down the street, excuse me, to Prince Rupert. So, uh, and I believe there's some reference to Fort Simpson in there as well. Then, somewhat later on, after the depression was over, he got going again. And things were really tough in, in that area of Canada. I remember finding a note on file, and it was a note from the director of the museum to Marion Barbeau. And if I can recall the wording, it said, uh, Dear Dr. Barbeau, we regret to inform you that we're not able, because of present financial circumstances associated with the depression, to send 